Good morning, everyone. This is Sam Allred. I bring you greetings. I'm in my home office of Heber City, Utah this week. Thanks so much for joining me. This is the this is an introductory webinar. It's a program that, that Gordon Crater and I teach. We put it together about two and a half, three years ago. It's called Leading Positive Change. And uh, I'm excited about it. It's truly one of the funnest things that I get to do each year is to teach this a few times with him. And and uh, we've already taught it a couple times and have a couple more scheduled. And only one of those is open enrollment. That's the one I'll talk about and give you dates for today. We have some large firms that have sent people through it and said, oh, this is what we need. And so they kind of gobble up some dates on a calendar and have us do it. And my purpose is to just try to lay this out and say, what really is this program? And how do we feel like it could help you or help your firm? So uh, quick background, we get to work with close to 500 uh, accounting firms across North America. We love that, we deem it a huge privilege. We see that uh, in virtually all of them, they wanna change, they wanna get better, they wanna improve. We have, as you know, a host of changes coming to us as a profession. I didn't make a list of those, but if I think off the top of my head, the, the biggest ones that I see that are coming to us that will impact us, and some of them will change us in a significant way. Certainly we have a continuing host of retiring partners as the baby boomers retire. That will change in so many ways, most every firm uh, in the profession. Uh, also, because of the baby boomers retiring, we have a host of our clients in their C-suites, CEOs, COOs, CFOs that are going to retire. That's going to uh, affect, in many ways, the loyalty of clients to their accounting firms. We, we anticipate seeing more clients change accounting firms in the next decade than we've seen in three decades combined. We, there's this major change in technology coming. It's not a question of if, it literally is a question of when, but with artificial intelligence and blockchain and other things, we see the, the, the traditional roles of audit and tax changing significantly because so much data will be prepared automatically. We've been paid for decades and decades and decades to be historians. Um, and, and in the future, nobody's gonna pay for that role because because the, the um, organization and accumulation and preparation and presentation of data will all be done electronically. So this role of historian will go away and it will force us, good, not bad, force us to become his, uh, advisors. And that's a, a major change that will impact our profession. Uh, the workforce is changing. It's all about engagement and retention and it's become a little bit of a Mount Everest experience for some firms to get and keep people and help them see a long-term career in the, in the firm rather than I'll be here two years on my resume and then I'll go. And uh, certainly we also see a major change coming in workforce. Uh, footprints, office footprints are getting smaller, not larger. Uh, more people are being allowed to work in their own space, from their own home, wherever they are. And uh, those are just some of the changes coming. Here's the issue that I want to address with this, and it's that all change in any form for any firm is difficult. D just historically, ask anybody that's tried to lead it, and they'll tell you it's been difficult. And the thing that, that got our attention for Gordon and I a number of years ago is we, we just began to study this. We had read about it for years, but we had read in, in, in so many different articles that 70% of all change efforts fail. So what we did is that we went and looked at so many firms. Uh, for, again, I, I've had the privilege of working with hundreds of firms, and Gordon Crater was the managing partner at Plant Moran and so had exposure to lots of firms, but we collectively studied a ton of change initiatives in, in our profession. 50 of them to be exact, that we studied. They're common change initiatives. They're things that most every firm has tried to do. And we look to see in those common change initiatives, if we had as a profession, the same failure rate that the business world has had. And it wasn't overly surprising that we had that. 70% of all change efforts failed. What surprised us more was 
some of the most logical change initiatives, things that firms really should do, had at least a 70% failure rate. And I'll share some of that as we go forward and talk about that. So almost every change initiative we looked at of these 50 begin with really great anticipation. This is going to be important. This is good for the firm. This is good for the partner group. This is going to help us from a from, from, from a recruiting standpoint, an engagement standpoint, a retention standpoint, a client service standpoint, a business uh, market standpoint. And somewhere along the way, that excitement turned to frustration. And most of those change initiatives failed. And, and would ask you, because we looked at this, we'd ask you to consider what's the impact on firm culture of having a failure rate of 70% or in some cases higher with, with the things that you talk about, you get excited about, you announce, you, you track, there's a bright spotlight on it. And um, that impacts the firm. It imp impacts mostly the youngest generation in so many different ways. Our biggest shock, my personal biggest shock in all of this was, and I mentioned this, alluded to this earlier, when we looked at those change initiatives, in almost all cases, and listen to this carefully, the strategy behind the change was sound. The, the timing was right. It would benefit the firm. All the, all the stars seemed to line up. The, 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 the firm adopted a really good process, set of steps, to, to embrace the change initiative, and there was still failure. There, there was still a 70% or higher failure rate. Even when it was the right thing to do, it would benefit the firm, the timing was right, it was well thought out, there were proper steps to follow. Even because I assumed when we looked at this change uh, uh, failure rate, I just assumed Guys, the timing was lousy. You didn't do a good job picking the right thing. You didn't do a good job announcing it. You didn't put the right people in charge. You didn't follow the right steps. I just assume you missed something. And that wasn't the case. And, and that was my biggest epiphany as we studied this was you, you could pick all the right things and still experience a high failure rate and change. So why? Why was there such a high failure rate? That's where our focus turned to in uh, three years ago as we studied this. The majority of the failures, more than 70% of the failure, came on the people side of things. It was either resistance to the change itself, or leaders in the firm, that would be partners, senior managers, maybe in some cases managers, not embracing the change. In other words, most change failures were not process failures. They were not that you didn't follow the right steps. They're people failures. They're these things, these four things. For firm members at all levels who just want to keep things the same. You might say life is pretty good, don't mess it up. Usually that comes from a senior level in the firm, that attitude. But in this case, it was, it was all levels in the firm. They're anchored in whatever the status quo was and they don't want to see it change. It was firm leaders who would give grudging compliance but not spirited commitment to the change. And I just, I've said this phrase before just because it, 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 it to me is so obvious, but you can spot grudging compliance about 100 yards away when somebody doesn't want to do something. You can see it in their body language, their emotions, their lack of energy, effort, attitude. It, it, it was a firm culture, and this is vital to understand because most firms are guilty of this. It's a firm culture that honestly keeps people from voicing their concerns. It, we, we talk more about how great it's going to be, why we need to do it, why it's so good, rather than talk about the honest concerns that they might have. And so we don't engage in open, honest dialogue. We have way too much artificial harmony in firms across our profession. And then last of all, it's a culture that fosters a genuine fear of failure. Rather, rather than, than realizing that failure is, 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 can be a positive step forward to learning and understanding. And, and, and uh, as a mentor of mine used to say, we can, 
We can debit experience and credit cash when we have failures, but we can learn from it. So often we, we foster a genuine fear of failure. And, and the fear of failure is at the highest levels in the firm. There's a bigger fear of failure at a partner level than there is at a staff level. So let me just take one example. Of these 50 that we studied, and if I were to give you the list of 50, you'd recognize every one of them, but I'll just take one of them. Firms, every firm I know in North America has tried to get rid of, of their worst clients, get rid of the D-level clients. Every firm I know has done that, but usually multiple times. But, but by the way, it's got a 92% failure rate. It just, it, it blows my mind that the failure rate's so high with that change initiative that makes so much sense. And why does it make sense? I mean, there's like 10 reasons. I'll give you the four that are on this slide, but there's so many reasons why this makes sense. Those clients that you want to get rid of make everybody sick. They put a pit in everybody's stomach. All you got to do is see their, that client name on your calendar and, and, and you know it's not going to be a good day. You miss a call from them. You get an email from them. You get a text from them and, and you know it's not going to be good. You just instantly have the pit in your stomach. Those are the clients, first of all, you're trying to get rid of. And the firm would be better in so many ways without having those pits in the stomach. Second of all, those very clients that put a pit in your stomach undervalue your services. I, this is a phrase I adopted years ago, but they treat every invoice like an invitation to a debate. There's a visual for you. You, you, you don't ever want to record all your time. You don't ever want to send them a bill. You know they're going to fight every single bill. So, so not only do they put a pit in your stomach, you don't even want to record all the time that you have to spend on their behalf. They live in quadrant one. That's a Stephen R. Covey uh, reference to, to everything being urgent and everything being important. And we can get trapped into quadrant one. And listen to this carefully. There is not a D-level client on the planet that I've ever seen that isn't trapped in quadrant one. All of them are there. Because, by the way, separate dialogue, separate discussion. It takes great discipline to work in quadrant two, things that are important but not urgent. And that's the only way out of quadrant one. And D-level clients are the most undisciplined clients on the planet. So they are always gonna be trapped into quadrant one. And when you work on them, serve them, you get stuck in that quadrant. You live in that quadrant. It's a lousy place to be. It wears you out, wears out your energy. And then fourth of 10 really reasons why we ought to get rid of them, Fourth is they're demanding and often high risk. They cut corners, they burn every bridge. Um, they're, they're always victims. They got a victim mentality, always blaming somebody else for, for their demise or their defeats or their frustration or whatever it is. They're really lousy to work with. You probably got that already from the tone of my voice. So it makes complete business sense to get rid of them. So, so, so it begs the question, if it makes such good sense to get rid of them, and it would be in the firm's best interest to do so, and most everybody would benefit if you got rid of them, then why in the world is there a 92% failure rate of all the firms collectively that have tried to get rid of D-level clients when it makes so much sense to do it? And too often, firms focus most of their energy on what are the steps we're, they're going to follow and not on the people side of, of the issue. So they get really good steps. Here would be an example. These, uh, I've seen so many firms that have tried to do this and looked at the steps they were following, and, and uh, these make sense. I mean, management talks about it, believes in it. Management could be the, 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 the managing partner of the firm, the EC, the management team, the board. They talk about it. It makes sense. They, they stand up and talk to their partners about why it makes such sense to get rid of the worst clients. They identify the criteria. They attach the criteria to the clients, thereby identifying who the D-level clients are. Those are all logical steps. That, then assignments are made. Nobody tries to do it overnight. I've seen a lot of firms try to do it over a two or three year period. You know, let's, if, if, there's, if we're going to do it over three years, that's nine trimesters. Let's get rid of a ninth of them each trimester. That's logical. That's not crazy. At the end of the day, I don't care how many steps you got. At the end of the day, there's that last one. There's a few bus stops for bad clients. All the energy, all the effort, all the talk, very few bus stops for bad clients. You're still serving them. In most cases, you're still serving them at the same rate, the same frustration, and, and, and nothing's changed. Other, other than the fire drill, nothing's changed. 
if here's a key takeaway that I give you, if you only look at the process, the steps you're going to follow and, and, and the communication that you need, and you don't look at the individuals that, that, that need to understand why they're doing it, know the skills that it takes to do it, whatever the change is, and have a chance to share what, what they're concerned about and frustrated about, and, and you don't listen to that, you're not going to get there. And, and so the rule of thumb we give is put equal emphasis on process and on behavior. Spend at least as much time talking about the behavior, talking about why it would concern somebody to get rid of, in this case, get rid of a D-level client. The fact that they've never been trained how to do it and they really, it makes them uncomfortable. The fact that they don't know how to do business development and not sure where a replacement client's gonna come from. The fact that they really think it's gonna impact them personally uh, a fire in a D-level client is, is going to impact them personally and their professional demeanor in the marketplace and all kinds of different things. If you don't have honest dialogue about those things, I don't care how good your steps are, you're going to fail because the people side of it's going to sabotage everything else. Now, I'm giving you just one change initiative. We studied 50, and on all of them, it was the people side that killed the change initiative. Maybe one other thing I'll share before I talk about what we teach in the workshop, because by the way, this is one of the things we teach. So often we stand up and tell everybody, these are firm leaders and everybody means well, so that nobody's mean spirited about this. We tell everybody, this is gonna be good. We're gonna be a better firm if we go through this change, whatever it is, a software change, implementing a new process, opening a new market, whatever it is. Management's thought it through and says, this is gonna be good. But what we fail to tell everybody is it's going to feel lousy for a while before it ever starts to feel good. We just tell them it's going to be good. And we take everybody through what we call the swamp of despair. In every single change initiative, we lead people down into the swamp of despair. And we start by saying, this is really going to be good for all of us. You're going to be glad we're doing this. And then that swamp of despair might last three months. It might last six months. If it's done right, it shouldn't last longer than that. In some cases, we can shorten it and shallow it. And we teach how to do that in the workshop. But in so many cases, we don't prepare them for the swamp of despair. We just tell them it's going to be great that we're doing this. This is a smart move. This is a healthy move. This is something that we need to do. And we are, in many cases, being as honest as we should be and how that swamp of despair is really going to feel as we all go down into it before we ever come up the other side. There is a swamp of despair with every single change initiative we will ever lead our people into. And part of helping improve the behavior side, which is the sabotaging side of change initiatives, is we've got to be more honest with our people than we have been. So how can we help you? Well, let me just talk about this workshop that we put together. Um, the primary purpose is to help, help you have much better results, way more success with all your change initiatives. That's, that's the whole purpose of the Leading Positive Change Workshop. The one that we have that's what we'll call open enrollment because we're doing other ones that are already tied up either by an association or they're tied up by a firm. Um, we have a two and a half day workshop. It's gonna be held November 20th, 21st and 22nd. It's in downtown Chicago. And we are excited about that. Let me just talk about what will be taught in that. First of all, who ought to attend? Looking back in the last two and a half years or so that we've been teaching this, we think the results have been the highest. First of all, everybody that's come through it has loved it. And what we hear over and over again is this the best training we've ever had. We don't see it as a leadership training course. Everybody keeps saying, what's the best leadership training we've ever had? That's, that's just because we're teaching things that they maybe didn't understand before, but we don't see it as leadership training. But what we see is the firms that will benefit the most would be wise to look across the firm and say, let's get a key team of people that we'll call our change management team. In any significant change that we're going to have going forward, 
We want these people involved because they're going to understand how we ought to organize it, how we ought to communicate it, the steps that we ought to follow. They have the greatest success at whatever the change initiative is. We have a lot coming to us again as a profession, but that's how we envision this workshop being the most beneficial is that you would pick a change management team. We don't care how many that is. It obviously would be more than two or probably three people, but it would be whatever the number. We've had firms that have, that, that have picked five people or seven people or 10 people. We have firms that want to have a whole bunch of their people trained, and that's why they're having us just come in and do it. But it would be a change management team that would come, meaning that they would be in pretty significant leadership seats across the firm right now, uh, and they would have a great passion about the firm's future. They would be heavily involved in any significant changes going forward, and we would teach them the exact process they need to follow, which includes the people side of it, to have the highest degree of change, success they can have with those change initiatives. So some key elements I'll talk about. Gordon Crater and I are teaching the workshop. We have been dear friends for two decades plus. Uh, he has uh, stepped down in his role as, as managing partner of Plant Moran, did that a couple years ago, and we've always talked about wanting to work together, and that was the opportunity for us to do that. We looked at where we thought we could be the most impactful and very quickly centered on help firms learn how to um, have more success with their change initiatives. So this is something we love doing. We have the funnest time doing this together. Uh, we take a very holistic approach. We teach a process. You can see it there on your screen. It's a six-step process. It's uh, uh, very quickly you understand what are the benefits that you're looking to achieve if you can have success in this change initiative. What stands in your way? And most of that's going to be people-related. What are the people-related issues that stand in your way? What, do you really what really constitutes moving the dial and having success? We call it needle moving assessment, but what really constitutes having success with this change initiative? Some many change initiatives are subjective in nature. Some can be objective, but they all can be measured. Then we talk about how do you really put together the right action plan? What's the best way to communicate this before the change, during the change, and after the change? And what does it really take to have discipline to have success with a change? We teach all six of those things in terms of a process. Here is the agenda. We start by teaching 10 key principles of effective change. I'm going to talk about some of those in just a minute. We, we talk in depth about why most change efforts fail. We talk about how do you, what are the things that you could do that would consistently create a better culture to embrace change. We talk about how you measure change, and then we introduce that six-step process, and all afternoon of the first day, we organize you into teams, we give you the 50 change initiatives that we studied, and we allow your team to pick any one that they want of those 50, or any other one, pick any one they want, and they're going to actually lead a, a change initiative with that change, whatever that change uh, initiative they pick, they're going to lead it. And, and they're going to actually go through those six steps, actually four of the steps the first day. And then they're going to present it. And we use a tool that everybody can see and work together on. So each of the teams, which are roughly um, six or seven people together, they pick one of those change initiatives to work on in that first day in the afternoon. And they actually present it and everybody gives them feedback. The second day, I'm going to skip the first part and look at this, the, the last all afternoon again is problem solving round two. We mix you up into a different group with the same thing, pick another change initiative and lead it. It's amazing between day one and day two how quickly people learn the, that process and how much better they are. Every workshop we've ever done, everybody notices how much better they are it gives you encouragement. You can really learn as a group how to get way better at leading change in a very short period of time. You'll see that instantly in one day, how much better you are in leading a change initiative. The second day, we talk about passive resistors and why they're the biggest ones. The ones you can't, you don't really notice right out. They're not fighting it, but they are resisting it. And passive resistors do more to kill change initiatives than anybody else. Surprising even more than those that throw out anchors and try to stop the change, they're not more impactful than passive resistors. So we talk about how to recognize them, 
how to deal with them. We talk about what kinds of things to select and how many things you can select. We talk about how to develop change agents throughout the entire firm, people that are willing to help you lead change and why it's so vital at all levels, all levels in the firm to develop and enable change agents. Then we talk about communication. The, the, the key things you need to understand of how to communicate before the change initiative, during it, and after it. Then the third day we talk about gentle pressure relentlessly implied. That's the discipline. The discipline to really have success with change. We talk about why it's so, so important to take some time and celebrate change, what that does for your culture. And then we do talk about the top changes that firms are going to need to make if they want to remain independent and have success in the future. So that gives you the agenda for two and a half days. It starts at eight each day for the first two days. It ends at six. We have a break in the morning and the afternoon. We I have a break, certainly an hour for lunch. And then the third day starts at eight in the morning and ends at noon. So that gives you an idea of what the agenda is. As I mentioned earlier, it's highly interactive, uh, a lot of interaction, a lot of exercises, organizing you into teams. You get a chance to network with your peers and, and really collaborate on solutions and, and really find insights and in what it takes to change. I did mention that we talk about, we start with 10 key principles and, and principles are vital. They don't ever change. And, and I just find really good things happen when we follow principles and bad things happen when we violate them. And principles are like tenets or anchors or enduring truths and they guide you in making good decisions. And what we've done is to identify the 10 key principles of any change initiative. And we use these, we use these symbols and these principles throughout the two and a half days so that you really become familiar with them. And, and they just become vital to help when you make good choices in how you lead change initiatives. And so we talk in depth throughout the workshop over and over again about these 10 principles of change. Couple quick things. That, that I'll finish with, with every single thing we do, and this is significant, I don't think it's minor, with everything that we do in Upstream, we have an unconditional guarantee. It, it, there's no strings attached. If, if, if you attend to anything, go through anything that we do and you're not completely satisfied, then at, at your option, we'll either waive the fee or accept the portion that you feel like it reflected your level of satisfaction. We've done that since day one. We started Upstream Academy almost 20 years ago, and uh, we just feel like that's the way all of us ought to do business in, in any setting. There is CPE. It's two and a half days worth of, of CPE. And the investment in this is uh, each participant is $3,500 or 3250 for additional participants and UAN members that belong to Upstream Academy Network pay 3200 and 3000 for each additional. And that's the investment in that. Again, it is an investment of both time, money, resources, but the return on the investment is to learn how to successfully lead positive change. And, and that's where we feel like we really stand out. We have done so much to help good firms learn how to get even better and how to become high performing firms and our track record is just stellar in terms of what we can do to help firms get better but this change initiative was just something that stood out to us as we looked at this three years ago and said there's so much change coming to our profession and the, the sad thing is without trying to be offensive we stink at change as a profession we have stunk at change and so that's where Gordon and I looked and said, how can we figure out how to help firms get so much better about how to lead successful change? With any change initiative, what do they do to properly prepare their people? What do they do to communicate it? What are the steps they follow so they can make sure they have a high degree of success, not a high degree of failure with change? There is my email address if you get questions about this uh, uh, at any relationship to this. I'm happy to respond in detail to your question and help you in any way. We're excited about this. It's had a great degree of success. We do cap it. Uh, the, the, the workshop holds, um, I, I think it's 30 people max. We, we just, because of the team orientation, it is a workshop. We can't make it a, 
uh, uh, conference. It's just no way to teach it effectively that way. So it will be a workshop and capped at that number of people because we, we want to have the interaction. We want to form you into teams. That's where you'll do most of your learning and exercises and allow us to do most of our teaching is when you're in a team format working on something. So that there is a cap to that just so that you know. Best wishes. I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you so much for spending the time. Again, if I can help you in any way, there's my email address. Please don't hesitate to just shoot me an email. I'll give you a detailed reply. Best wishes. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.